Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Adrian Harris. He, uh, he's a, an, a distinguished professor at UT. His, his titles uh, go on and on. He's the uh, co-director of the Wagoner Center for Alcohol and Addiction Research. It's one of the, uh, one of the premier addiction centers in, in the whole world. It's a great strength of UT Neurosciences is addiction research. And uh, Dr. Harris is going to show you today that uh, addiction research is multifaceted and that he's going to be talking about one of the facets, which is inflammation and the way that it touches a lot of what happens, including, uh, including uh, addiction. So the way this works is that uh, Dr. Harris will give, give us his presentation. We'll take just a few minutes off. Uh, I, hope, I hope most of you have three by five cards, uh, if you got one on the way in. Write down a question if you have it. We have an army of undergraduates from St. Edwards and from UT, thank you guys, uh, who will pick them up and we'll assemble our panel and we'll have a question and answer session until they kick us out, okay? So anyway, thank you so much for being here and uh, Adron, thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks Mike. It's great, uh, great to be here. It's great to try to communicate some of the excitement of neuroscience that's going on at UT Austin now, especially with the new medical school being here. We'll have a panelist who actually is an immunopsychiatrist at the med school, and it's just so much fun to have them here. But, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was raised on a ranch in southern New Mexico, and so my summer job was herding cattle. So when I was a kid, when I was a little kid on the ranch, I'd go out with the cattle all day. I've been thinking back on that and been realizing there were actually a lot of lessons from taking care of cattle that transfer to neuroimmunology. And we're gonna talk about some of that. Now that may, be, that may seem like a stretch to you, but I hope I'll convince you that there actually are, are some things uh, uh, about that. Uh, and uh, so um, we'll... Talking about that, uh, this is, uh, this is um, uh, from the West Texas Livestock Weekly. This is me with my father uh, on, uh, on, the, on the ranch, <laughs> okay? So one thing, uh, a very important thing that you do is learn to recognize sick cattle, okay? If a, if a cow is sick, you have to, have to recognize that and take care of them. And there's a couple of things about, about that. And here we, we can see this is, there's one clue here we never had on our ranch, and that is that there's a veterinarian next to the cow uh, generating billable hours. We never paid veterinarians. Okay? Uh, but uh, a, a, sick, a sick cow will be off by itself. It will, won't be eating, and it won't be drinking. Okay? And that's a very strange situation. So just a, a bacterial infection or a viral infection causes an, an animal to do this. Now, for the, for the animal, the most important thing they can do is be with the herd. These are herd animals that are vulnerable if they're by themselves. They have to eat a lot and they have to drink a lot to stay alive. So what's going on here? Why, why, is, why, is, why is this doing, why is it the, the brain has told the animal to do something that's completely against all the important instincts for survival, okay? So how is that, how is that going on? So that, um, why does this happen, and, and how does this happen are, are the things that, uh, uh, that I'd like to talk about. And in, in order to do this, we have to talk about neuroimmunology. And actually, there's a whole course at UT Austin, an undergraduate course on neuroimmunology, so I can't possibly tell you very much about it in about 30 minutes. But let me, let me make three, three key points here before we go on to some of the details. There's three ways that neuroimmunology is looked at. And the first one that I'm gonna start out with is that peripheral immune activation regulates brain function. And this is, uh, this is a review article here saying, saying inflammation, sickness, and depression when the immune system subjugates the brain. So this is the idea that the immune system can control the brain and control behavior. Okay? The second one, is that immune signaling reflects pathology and leads to neurodegeneration. Now, in the periphery, activation of the immune system is to kill off invaders. It's to kill off the bacteria and the virus. And so when the brain's immune system is activated, it can do some of these same things. And this is probably very important in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, some of the, all of the neurodegenerative diseases. I'm not gonna have time to talk about that today. The other one that I, I think is particularly interesting is that the brain uses immune signaling 
as, uh, to contr uh, as normal for normal brain function. And that neuronal plasticity, those of you who have extend attended some of the other ones here will know that the brain is always remodeling itself. And the immune system is very, in, that's contained within the brain is very important for this. It turns out that the immune signaling system in the periphery for infection is a very sophisticated signaling system. All of that is represented in the brain. But there are no bacteria or viruses should, should, should never be in the brain. So what is it doing there? The brain has co-opted this sophisticated signaling system for its own use in, in order to regulate normal brain function. And, and we, will, we will touch on that a bit. But, but let's get back to the cow. And why, why, is it, why is it doing this? That, uh, that usually, uh, th and this is expressed not only in cattle, but we'll see that it's in rodents and it's in us. I mean, all of the same thing happens when, when we get sick. And is, can this benefit the individual? No, not at all. So I pointed out this is absolutely detrimental to the individual to do this. So it's been rather puzzling evolutionarily as why this happens. And it must be because it's for the benefit of the herd for the group. And, and this is a self-imposed quarantine. So it keeps this animal away from the herd so it doesn't infect the rest of them. It keeps them out of the feed supply and it keeps them out of the water hole. So they have been isolated. So, so the, the, in, the, uh, in, uh, the response, the body's response to infection is to enforce a quarantine. And that's why you go to your room and lay down when, when, you, when you feel bad. Okay. So, so how? How is, it, how is this happening? It's not completely understood, but the idea is that, that infection activates the immune system to kill the invader. And, and one part of this is production of things called cytokines, and I'm going to return to these several times, that these are, these are th uh, things that are produced by the immune system that activate signaling. But they also affect the brain. The brain is programmed to respond to these cytokines and result in the sickness response. So the immune system does two things. It starts killing the invaders, but it also reprograms the brain to put, to put the individual in, in isolation. So this is a fascinating thing. Is that the, how is the immune system controlling the brain, and how, how, how can this be studied? Okay? And so I'm going to go through a couple of ways that we've gotten some information and some knowledge. And I should say that this is still, a, um, still evolving, that it's only in about the last 10, 12 years that we've really appreciated how important this is. And people have begun to look at mechanisms and, and had the tools to look at mechanisms. But one thing is that bacteria and viruses are too complicated. We don't, we don't want to have, in our test system, we don't want to put in whole bacteria. They do too many things. That we need a, a simpler system, or at least my view as a reductionist scientist is that you have to have something simpler. So you, you get a bacterial component, you need a simpler compound that you can do to produce the sickness response. So now you could, can get sickness from a small component that I'll, I'll explain in a minute. But how do you find the target of that? Uh, and, and how do we analyze the mechanism, the machinery of this? And you, uh, you, you get lucky and you do difficult work using mouse genetics, okay? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those. So the, the, uh, the, here we have a happy bacteria that's ready to infect and do damage. Uh, and it has a lot of different components, but what was found is that a few components from this outside of the cell wall were enough to produce the sickness response. And that's called lipopolysaccharide or, or LPS. It's a chemical that can be chopped off of the outside, purified, and used. So, so, so now we have a way to study it. How do, how do we do that? And so we, we use uh, uh, that a lot of the progress has been made by using mice. And these mice are fascinating because we have a great variety of experimental mice. Here are two of them, the B6 mouse and the D2, two of the most widely used in neuroscience and other areas of biology. These mice are different in, in every way. Uh, that first of all, you, that all of, all of the D B6 mice are genetically identical to each other, all the D2s are, gen so we've got a great genetic control. But we've really got a lot of differences among these mice. Now, I'm at one point I'm gonna come back to, is that we have used is that the, the B6 love to drink alcohol. Give them alcohol, they, they are, they, they'll, they'll take almost all their fluid from a bottle of alcohol, even when water is available. Now, these guys will not touch alcohol. They're ab absolute teetotalers, okay? So we've got, and, and they, I'm just showing to them, but there's a lot of different strains. So, so kind of an interesting story is, how did these come about? Surely, so scientists really worked to derive all these different mice that we could have? No, actually they didn't. 
that these came from mouse fanciers in the 1800s and 1900s and in Asia, Europe, and America, first in Asia. And they bred mice because they thought they were cute and they wanted them to be the same and they, and they wanted the coat colors they, the, to be different and they, they wanted different, and in doing this, they accidentally fixed genes. They accidentally created a whole diversity of mouse lines that were later used by scientists. And one of these mouse fanciers was Miss Abby Lathrop in, in Granby, Massachusetts. And, 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 and starting around 1900, she began to appreciate that some of her mice got cancer and some of them didn't. And it was very reliable. It ran in families. So she began studying that. And so she, she was the first to discover a link between hormones and cancer back in 1916 using her pet mice. Okay? So this is an amazing, an amazing story of mouse, ge of mouse genetics. So that, that uh, we, when, we, when, oops, when we inject uh, LPS in, in, into, we can inject LPS into the mice, and in almost all mice, that they display the sickness response, the same as cows and, and, and us. But it was noticed that there's a few specific rare mutant mice that after LPS, they're fine. There's no effect at all. Okay? And this was a spontaneous mutation that arose. So this is probably a single gene mutation. There's probably a single gene that's in these, been changed in these mice. It's absolutely critical for the sickness response. Can we find that? Okay. How, how do you find that? And so it was uh, that, that there was some very careful work done, some molecular biology of anal analyzing this, um, that then identified a, a single protein that the, the called TLR4, toll-like receptor protein 4, that these, the mice that do not get the sickness response lack the, this protein. So that really showed that that, 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 that was criti critically important, that if, if, uh, when this was mutated in, in these mice, that then they're, then they're fine. And uh, this was a work from Bruce Boitler's lab at, at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And this was published, and I should say, so this, uh, the scientific publications, of course, are, are our deliverables. This is the main thing that comes out of our labs, are scientific publications. So they're, they're extremely critical, and it's kind of interesting to know a little bit about the culture of them. One part of the culture is that the last author is the lab leader, the person who's responsible for it. You might think they would be first, but in fact, it's a lab leader. You often have multiple authors because increasingly science requires multiple people, multiple approaches, multiple talents and everybody becomes a co-author, but it's, the, it's the, the last author that's important, Bruce Boitler. The other thing that, about this that I would, I would tell my students is that you want to have a very clear, simple title for your papers. Th this has got all this stuff in it. I mean, do we need to know that the, the, all the designations of these mice? And it never really quite comes to the point of what's the significance of this, right? And so I, I would say that this, might, this paper wouldn't get the recognition that it should. So, so how, did, how did this work out for Bruce uh, then? Well, you, you know, um, uh, actually, the, the king of Sweden apparently liked the title of this paper more than I did. <laughs> So, so he invited Bruce over to get the Nobel Prize. So that, so that but I think another thing that, that was 2011. Another thing it, it indicates is how how this a very basic concept of immunology was only only fairly recently been developed and recognized by a Nobel Prize in in in, two, in 2011. So, um, so this this has led to a really an, an, a beginning of, to dissect and realize how intricate all this signaling is, that this is a very simplified view of innate immune signaling where LPS attaches to TLR4 at the top. That was the part that, that Bruce developed in, in that paper. And that the output is cytokines uh, and, 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 and chemokines. But in between, there's a huge amount of machinery that, that leads to a change in gene expression that I'm going to start out talk about in a minute that produces these cytokines. Then the cytokines go to the brain to produce the sickness response. So it's very complicated. One point I would, I would make about this is that 
So used to we thought of this as being more direct, like LPS works acts up here and cytokines come out down here, pretty direct. But, but in fact, there's a huge amount of machinery in the middle. And this is, is not a direct linear process, but it's like a spider web. And whenever you pull on one part of the spider web, you distort another part of the spider web. And this has been a big problem with therapeutics, immunotherapeutics, trying to manipulate the immune system with drugs. There's two things that happen whenever you, whenever you say, oh man, this is a great target, let's develop a drug against it. Two things happen. The, the first one is the drug never works as well as you think it will. And the second is it always has more side effects than you think it will, okay? Because it's a more complicated system. And so a, a, a couple of our, of our panelists uh, tonight, uh, especially Laura Ferguson, is working on developing computational approaches to where you can model this and predict drug effects based on, on, on drugging the network, drugging the gene network rather than drugging individual targets. So maybe we'll have a chance to, to, to talk about that. But this is all. This has all been basic science. What about disease? What about medicine? Can we? Are, are there any benefits that can can come from this? And so let's let's look at let's look at some of the top causes of, of disability worldwide. Now, if we look at disability for young individuals, and this is important because these are the most important, most productive years of life. Whenever whenever you produce disability at this stage, you have a real consequence, not only for the individual but for society uh, as a whole. And so if we look at the major things that depressive disorders, unipolar depressive disorder bipolar depressive disorders are two of the major, major health problems. Uh, there's, uh, there's also alcohol use disorder. So I'm going to talk about for, for, for these things. And, and if, if this, is, this, is a, this is for 2000, if it was done now, probably opiate addiction would pop up in here as well. So addiction and depression are two of the main, main causes of disability. Can, it, can, can, are there any lessons from neuroimmunology to help with those conditions? And so that leads to this question, is this cow depressed, right? So, but, or maybe more importantly, how do we diagnose depression in humans? What is, what is depression in humans? And so this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Criteria for Major Depressive Disorders, that, uh, that if you have five of these nine present nearly every day, it qualifies as depression. So there's nine here. So seven of these nine are sickness responses, are produced by infection, okay? So de depressed mood, decreased interest in pleasurable activity, weight change or change in appetite, change in sleep, change in activity, fatigue, all of that is exactly what that cow had, right? I mean, the, the, this is, so, so could, is it possible that part of depression is an elevation of these cytokines that we've been that we've been talking about that produce these symptoms, and there there is evidence for that. That this is looking in in, uh, in uh, normal controls, major depressive dis, uh, disorder, bipolar. These are two cytokines: interleukin one and and TNF alpha. So these are the blood levels of, of two cytokines, and you can see that that they're roughly doubled in people with depression. And what's more interesting, if we look at the individual subjects that were studied over here, we can see that there's a, there's a huge range uh, in, in the depressed people, that some of them have highly elevated cytokines, some of them don't. And so this, this may provide an opportunity for personalized medicine. In other words, these people may, be, may benefit from anti-inflammatory or anti-cytokine treatment more than these. So this may be a bio, biomarker of disease. It may be that there are different populations, different reasons for depression that should be treated in different ways. In fact, in fact, there have been clinical trials done that, that support this, where, where adding an anti-inflammatory an inflammatory drug to a traditional antidepressant improves outcome for people with elevated cytokines. Um, so this is a really a fascinating story. I don't have time to go into it, but I recommend the, this book, The Inflamed Mind by Edward Bulmore. Edward Bulmore is a psychiatrist in England. He's at Oxford. And he wrote this, this popular language book. Uh, it's a very, he explains very clearly about cytokines, neuroimmunology, much better, much better than I did. He also talks about the history of medicine, the history of psychiatry. Uh, he, he went to work for AstraZeneca uh, part-time to try to, to develop uh, anti-inflammatory treatments for depression, so he really knows about the drug industry and the challenges to drug development. And, and one challenge was that shortly after he joined AstraZeneca, they decided to stop all neuropsychiatric research and fired him. But you know, that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, rec I recommend that for, for depression. Okay. So 
what about addiction? And those who know me are asking how I could speak for this long without saying something about addiction. So, so I, uh, I, I want to go through my, again, personal uh, reductionist view that, that uh, earlier, a uh, couple months ago, Bob Messing gave a great lecture here. Mickey Marinelli gave a great one two months ago. So I, I, won't, uh, I won't dwell on that, but I just want to talk a couple of ways that, that neuroimmune signaling impacts on, on addiction. And to start, to start that, uh, I want to show my view, uh, uh, my very simple-minded view of addiction is that initially the, the drug interacts with the synapse in, in the brain. But this initially is reversal. This is shown as intoxication or the acute effects of the drug. The drug goes away, the person comes back to normal. That's all fine. But with chronic heavy drug use combined with the right genes and environment, this leads to stable changes in, in the brain. So now when the drug is withdrawn, the brain is not normal. There are, there are withdrawal signs, there's craving, there's disruption of sleep, there are persistent problems that result when the drug is not there. That, that they can be corrected by the person resuming drug taking, which is why this is a chronic relapsing d disease. And the brain is not normal without the drug at this point. At this point, the drug becomes the most important thing for the brain. And as I said, this, de this depends on the amount of drug taken over time, but also the, 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 the person's genetics as well as environment. And here, environment includes access to the drug, it includes access to other, uh, other activities other than drug, it includes stress, it includes trauma, all of the, th the things that Dr. Marinelli talked about um, uh, last, last, last month. Um, I always, using sort of a, of a, of a Texas-oriented analogy, I say that the genes load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Okay. So, uh, so what do I mean by, by reprogramming here, that the, that, the, the, that the drug has reprogrammed the brain? How is the program of the brain written? And for, for this, we have to go to the central dogma of molecular biology. Now, all dogma are wrong, but some dogma are useful. Okay. And uh, that this, I think, is one of the most remarkable things in, in all of biology, is that every cell in your body has the same DNA sequence. Yet, Yet they turn out so different. The heart is so different from the lungs and the brain and the brain and bones. But yet it's all from the same DNA. How can that be? That's because the, the, the DNA codes for these genes, there's about 20,000 in the human. And only a fraction of these are, trans, are changed to RNA. RNA is the message. They're said to be transcribed or written. The, DI, the DNA is written into RNA, and that forms the transcriptome. And it's which ones are turned on and how much, that the, the body is very sensitive to exactly how much of each one is being produced. And so in, in brain, we would have about 15,000 at any time, some highly produced, some lower. The most remarkable thing is that you, using new, new RNA sequencing techniques, we're able to very accurately measure the level of every one of these genes in a sample, every one of these RNAs in the, in the transcriptome. So we have a real measure of that. These, these RNAs are then turned into proteins, which, which produce function, which produce behavior. So in a way, the RNA or the, or the transcriptome is looking into the future. It's predicting what's going to happen in the cell. It's what the cell is thinking about. We can monitor that accurately, and that's, that's really exciting. That we, turn, we then turn to our favorites, that the mice. We have populations of mice, including these two, but many others, where we have high-drinking mice and low-drinking mice. These are genetic tools. So we can take these because, because, they're, they're genetic, because of the genetics, we, we don't have to actually give them alcohol. We know which ones are going to be high-drinking and low-drinking mice. So we can study genetic predisposition with these mice. We can profile, we can profile all, of, all of these transcripts, all, all of the gene expression in brain, and ask which ones are changed. Now, there's a great thing about this is it's unbiased. We're not saying we know what they are. We say we're going to look at everything and the data are going to tell us what, hap what happens. It's very important because we're so ignorant about brain function that we really can't predict very well what's going to happen. And that was certainly brought out, brought out by this study, where we expected, of course, to get, if you've come to these, you know it's, it's dopamine, it's GABA, it's ion channels, and so on. And what did we find? We found immune response genes were changed. When we were so ignorant when we did this back in 2006, we didn't even realize that these were supposed to be in brain. I th we thought this might be a mistake. I mean, why aren't these immune genes in brain? Then we read a little, the literature a little bit and said, oh yeah, you know, other people have, uh, have, have identified them in brain, it's just nobody's paid much attention to it. 
So he said, so immune genes are changing. That's, a, that's very strange. So, but this is a mouse genetic disposition. What about another model organism? A, a mo can we have a model organism where we have high prolonged alcohol intake as well as some genetic influence? And, and for that model organism, we, uh, we used the Australian alcoholic, okay? So uh, they're, um, they're a great model, a great model of this. People in, there are people in Australia that drink quite a lot. They don't use other drugs very much. Uh, and the main thing is that there's a new South Wales brain bank is really a tremendous resource for, for neuroscience, that they're, 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 they're quite good at, at getting huge amounts of information on the subjects at collecting high quality brain, brain tissue for, for, for experiments. So, uh, so we got that in the, in, the early, in the early days, Dane and I would actually fly to Sydney uh, and bring it back in, in uh, dry ice and carry on luggage. Uh, because we didn't trust the courier services uh, and, uh, and customs. <laughs> so, uh, um, that, uh, so, uh, uh, so when we did this, what did we get? The immune surprise. The immune surprise. I mean, we found a lot of things that, that ion channels and things like that, but the big one, the big one were, were the most, the most uh, one, some of the major changes, upregulated, downregulated, and so on, were uh, immune and cellular, cellular stress response. So again, in, in two different cases, this told us that we really had to pay some attention to the role of, the, of these uh, immune genes uh, in alcohol de dependence and predisposition to alcohol. We did a lot of studies on that, and one, one of these is shown here. One thing we did is we took these genes nominated from both the human and the mouse studies. We manipulated those in, in mice by deleting them one at a time from different mice. We had a total of nine genes. We deleted one at a time. Every one, every one of them, when we took them out of of our B6 high drinkers, they quit drinking. And so I think, so there were two things about this. And one is that at this point, it wasn't so clear that this global gene expression analysis would give anything useful. And so uh, in this, we conclude that the, these results provide the most compelling evidence to date that global gene expression can identify genetic determinants, and then specifically suggest a novel role for neuroimmune signaling in the regulation uh, of, of alcohol consumption. And so since then, there, there are a, a lot of work has been done from other laboratories around the world that, uh, that supporting this idea and have, have led to this, high, uh, this model where you know, alcohol uh, activates brain and, and liver innate immune response and, and then by, by production of, of cytokines and other mediators uh, that produce the inflammation in the, in the CNS. This, this promotes uh, alcohol consumption uh, and uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, escalates alcohol consumption. But the, the, the bad thing about this is that more alcohol feeds back on the brain to produce more of that. So it's a feed forward or a vicious cycle, as, as we call it. Uh, the vicious cycle is named, named after Sid Vicious, who he and Johnny Rotten um, uh, established the Sex Pistols. And uh, actually, actually, you can teach a lot of neurobiology of addiction by looking at Sid Vicious's life. He 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 appears frequently in my undergraduate class. And so, uh, uh, so, uh, so is there is there the question is is there a way to interfere with this? Are there are there any anti-inflammatory or immune? therapies that we could use uh, to, to interfere with this. And one, one part of, one attractive part of, of this is, is that you might be able to reposition something, that to, to start with from basic science and get to a therapy with a drug is extremely expensive. It's, 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 it's a, this top line is at least $1 billion and at least 10 years, if you're lucky. Okay, it could be more. But if you can take a clinical or marketed drug, then this greatly reduces the time and reduces the expense. Now, a lot of people are interested in anti-inflammatory drugs for other reasons. Is it possible we can reposition uh, those? Um, and so we're always watching for those. One that came out is, is Otesla or Premalas. If you watch television, you have seen advertisements. This is advertised all the time for psoriasis, okay? And uh, it's, a, it's an oral, it's taken orally, it's a pill, this is from the Otesla website, it's a pill that can help you achieve clear skin. And it works inside the body to help reduce inflammation. So this was very attractive, does it? It has very low side effects, it's, it's, well, it's well tolerated. 
And so this, this, this led to the rather, rather weird proposal that alcoholism is like psoriasis of the brain. And this may, may seem a bit crazy, but I was able to convince my colleagues at the, at the Scripps Research Institute to take a look in that. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, uh, there is medication development in alcoholism, a primalas versus placebo recruitment status, recruiting. So unfortunately, they're, they're right in the middle of this trial. I can't tell you if it's gonna work or not. I would love, I would love for it to work, but you know, we'll just see how the data come out. Uh, I may mention clinicaltrials.gov is a great place. All, all of the pending trials, whether they're being pr proposed, uh, as soon as they're approved, they go into clinicaltrials.gov. You can search this for any disease that you're interested in. You can find out what clinical trials uh, are, are, are going on. Um, so I didn't have time to talk about, about PTSD today, but I, I, will, I will mention it here. And it's one of these comorbid psychiatric diseases that goes together. We have depressive disorder, we have PTSD, we have alcohol use disorder. And depressed people tend to drink a lot, people who drink a lot tend to get depressed, people with PTSD use a lot of drugs and alcohol. So there's, there's certainly a commonality here in, in the phenotypes. And there are also commonalities in the risk, uh, in the risk factors, in stress and trauma uh, for, 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 uh, all, for all, all of these. Uh, and there are some common genetics that are shared among all of these. But we're not gonna change genetics, we're not going to reverse earlier stress and trauma. The other thing that's shared is inflammation, is activation of, of inflammatory signaling is shared. And maybe that's something that we can change, that we can interfere with. Where, where we might we might have some some possibility uh, of doing that and interfering with this cycle of neuroinflammation. So there are a number of anti-inflammatory pharmacotherapies that are in clinical trials uh, now, uh, and in, in, in including uh, a, a premolast. And uh, you know, so so with that, I'm going to uh, to uh, mention the next uh, brainstorms. Uh, Mike Mock. This is going to be really exciting. The artificial brain conversation about brains, computers, and artificial minds. Mike is a fascinating speaker. That will really, that will really be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, when we come back, we're gonna talk, uh, uh, we'll uh, meet with the panel members, which we have a great panel uh, tonight. Marisa Toop is, is the immunopsychiatrist that I mentioned. Dane Mayfield did the pioneering gene expression work. Laura Ferguson has done the computational work. Uh, Emma Erickson is a uh, graduate student also uh, investigating neuro, neuroimmune signaling. So with that, thank you.